cue motivational music. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name's Dean and I'm a designer on a quest. A quest to further understand the creative industry and learn as much as this noggin will hold. Join me as I share my discoveries and tap into the minds of some of the most well-respected creatives in the world. This is my creative therapy. Welcome to episode 16. Today I'm joined by design psychologist Toby Israel, who I've been wanting to speak to for what seems like forever. Um, we we talk about the differences between design thinking and design psychology, how creatives in the commercial world can benefit from design psychology, uh, Maslow's hierarchy pyramid, designing whilst under the influence of psychedelics, subliminal advertising, and loads more. I see that you studied at Trinity College, Hartford. I did. And when I was there, I majored in English and studio arts. Cool. The idea being that, especially with the studio arts, I was always interested in creativity. Things had to do with uh, expression through the arts. But um, apropos of women of my generation, I also got uh, certified to teach and ended up with my first job in teaching. But then I found out about a master's course in teaching the basic skills through the arts. Yeah. So I ended up uh, getting a master's degree at Rutgers University in that field, and particularly teaching the basic skills through the art of architecture. And I practiced this skill with my elementary school students uh, doing anything from building playgrounds with them to rearranging the classroom space, using their participation as uh, children designers to help me make decisions about the space. So I got yeah. more and more interested in children, design, uh, education, and also psychology of design, like what's going on with these kids and why are they experiencing the environment in such a fresh way compared to we adults who sometimes feel like, we, oh, well, we've seen it all. From there, I became visual arts coordinator for the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and was responsible for putting art in public places, the idea being, okay, well, perhaps that would be a really transcendent experience for people. But that was a lot to ask for a sculpture in a plaza. So uh, then I started to think about, well, maybe I wanted to be an architect. And I looked at all kinds of architecture schools and their catalogs. And most programs were about either the functional aspect of design, the historical aspect, the aesthetic aspect, some combination of two and, or the three, and very little about the psychology of design and the human element of design. And then an architect friend dragged me to a speech at Princeton University uh, by an environmental psychologist who was speaking to a room full of men wearing suits while well, she had her blue jeans on and was uh, just showing these amazing pictures of how a, a mental hospital designed by a famous architect drove the patients crazy and how environmental psychology, which is a field that looks at ways the environment affects people and people affect the environment in order to create a fit, mm -hmm. how that field, environmental psychology, really helped us look at places we build through a human lens, through a human factors lens. So it was like a lightning bolt hit me, and I applied for a PhD in environmental psychology and ended up actually back in England teaching at a university art, architecture, and design program, teaching environmental psychology there. That's kind of the background. That's awesome. I love that you were working with children and sort of observing their creativity. I guess different generations have a different approach and uh -huh. a kind of a different thought process around creativity. And that's 
probably from things like, you know, culture and society? Well, I don't think it's necessarily about generation, but it's more about age yeah. because there's certain ages when we're kind of in love with the environment, in love with the stimulation that it gives us. And the more we learn, quote unquote, the more we begin to label things and make them familiar to us in a kind of intellectual way. And sometimes when children do that, the magical aspect of experiencing the world in a fresh, unfiltered, unlabeled way gets left behind. So in my mind, that's why children are often more expressive, especially in the younger years. Mm. Yeah, I don't have kids, um, but my niece, when I go to visit, I'll sometimes just watch the way she kind of interacts with things and you can just see her imagination go crazy. Yes. And um, yeah, it's a shame we kind of lose that as we get older or at least lose the enthusiasm for it. Yeah. Well, there's a phrase, early childhood amnesia. We, for we forget how freshly we experience the world. We have a kind of amnesia about our early childhood experience. That's really interesting. So for, for those who aren't really familiar with design psychology, can you give us an overview of what it actually is? Okay, well, the official definition is the practice of architecture, planning, and interior design in which psychology is the principal design tool. And the purpose of design psychology, apropos of the little history that I told there, is to create places that aren't just functional and aesthetic, but emotionally and socially satisfying as well. So that's the kind of official official dumb. Uh, but how it differs from environmental psychology, for example, is environmental psychology is largely a research field, although much of the research is applied. But design psychology is really action-based, the emphasis being on design, not environmental. So design psychology, we delve into the psychology of the individual and design places based on their personal experience. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you how to do that, how we do that. It's not by waving a magic wand. It's by, mm -hmm. though that could be fun too, if you, if you were ch going back to childhood. What I do is I have a series of nine exercises, what I call a design psychology toolbox. They explore people's past, present, and future sense of place and home. So I take uh, individuals and sometimes groups through these exercises, and particularly when they do the exercises about the past, they do remember uh, some of those magical places in childhood. I do something called uh, place visualization, like a guided visualization, where I have people close their eyes and read a script, and they do remember places that they haven't been to in years. But lo and behold, very often they've kind of recreated those places or need to recreate those places if they want to have a similarly magical place in their present or future environment. Yeah. So uh, that's one exercise. Another exercise I do is called an environmental family tree, where people fill in a family tree, but not just of the names of ancestors. Uh, they fill in the tree in terms of places that their ancestors lived, both the large scale places and the dwellings. And then we kind of sit back and we realize very often, almost all the time, that there's some pattern that's repeated itself from generation to generation, uh, sometimes kind of mindlessly, albeit unconsciously. And uh, we look at whether, okay, uh, the person I'm working with, do they want to repeat that pattern? Do they want to live in the country even though they're in the city? Or do they want to live in the city even though they're in the country? Do they want to repeat the pattern? Do they want to change the pattern? or do some combination of the two. So as you can see, it's kind of like a deeper than deep dive. I know there's there's uh, organizations out there who say they do a deep dive in design thinking. Well, I say, particularly because I go to the unconscious level, what I do is a deeper than deep dive. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you ever 
use these methods for like brainstorming with like a, a creative agency or an in-house team? Right. I have done that brainstorm with an agency. Uh, very often I work with architects who are working on a group project. For example, in my book, Someplace Like Home, I talk about a school project that an architecture firm brought me in to work on where uh, rather than take people back, for example, to the homes of their past, I took a group of people, the, the design advisory committee, back to their childhood experience of schools through the year and then pulled out for them what were uh, what's called in design psychology world their highest positive associations with past place. In this instance, I got them to think back to their positive associations with past schools. And then we looked at collectively what, what words came out for everybody. For example, in the uh, school that I talk about in my book, Gathering Place came out for everybody in that uh, visioning session, design psychology session. And when we looked at the first draft of the floor plans for the new school, there weren't any real gathering places. Yet these were people, these were places, uh, people, participants in that visioning session remembered as really, really important. So we basically sent the architects back to the drawing board and they came up with group gathering spaces that similarly had lots of light as the group uh, brought that element to the fore. So yeah, they can be this can be done in groups as well as with individuals. Yeah, that's cool. I keep yeah, I keep going back to sort of like a design setting because that's kind of what I'm most familiar with. But mm -hmm. it, it's kind of weird that this isn't something that every agency does. Like it isn't right. a mandatory thing. Maybe maybe they do, and I haven't really heard of heard about it but you can almost imagine it to be like a, a a decent selling point for them as well like if they were pitching an idea to a client and they were mm -hmm. you know mentioning why they were choosing this color and this font uh you know mentioning that they've took a, a deeper dive into the reasons why you're not just looking at this from an you know aesthetically pleasing point of view but also from kind of like a, a subconscious level yeah, well, I mean, again, there are agencies like I don't know how well known IDEO is over in the UK, but they say they do a deep dive, which is great. But again, it's not a deeper than deep dive into the unconscious. Mm. And I feel like what people say they want is not necessarily what they want when you go to that deeper level. Yeah, it's... um. It's, it's weird because sometimes like from a designer's point of view as well, um, like personally, sometimes when I'm creating stuff, uh, I, there's no real reason behind, you know, choosing certain things. It just kind of works. Um, yeah, if I could just interject, you're absolutely right about that. Sometimes unconsciously, something just feels just right. So, for example, a designer might uh, suggest the creation of a room or a house design that just seems unconsciously so right to them. But what I found that very often it feels right to the designer because it's some echo of their past, which may be completely different from the echo of a client's past. So part of what design psychology does is it helps the designer and the client kind of differentiate between what seems just right to the client versus may, what may be just right in feeling uh, to to the client. Sorry, just right to the architect versus what seems just right to the client. Yeah, I would have loved to have been a fly on a wall when McDonald's were in a meeting with their in-house creative team, or if they were using an agency, and sort of mm -hmm. hearing them talk about things like color theory and why yellow and red communicates uh, speed and quickness. Right. Well, I'm a bit of a renegade when it comes to branding because I, I agree with you, this can be used for branding and sometimes that's a really good thing. But part of the idea of design psychology is that we're looking for a more authentic type of design, not one that we've come to believe is right because uh, design magazines, shelter magazines, or uh, what we call HGTV here, House and Garden TV tell us that that's what we should ought or must have. 
part of what this process does. It kind of differentiates from what's been branded into what's our personal uh, preference that may be very different from what's branded. But it also has uh, application to branding as well. Ah, okay, cool. So is would you say design psychology is the same as design thinking? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think they're similar in that most people who do design thinking are interested in the human aspect of design. I find that design thinking uh, kind of focuses more on problem solving and also uses anthropological techniques very often to uh, probe the depths of uh, the user. And those anthropological t techniques are very much about um, very often the culture, the society that the consumer comes from and so on, all of which I think is really important. Mm. But this design psychology goes deeper into the unconscious drivers that determine uh, how we think about design or what we choose also in relation to design. Mm. It, it almost sounds quite meditative. Would you kind of say that, that this kind of practice and tools that you use uh, borderlines meditation? Uh, well, it depends upon the techniques that the group uses. Um, so, for example, in my guided visualization, that maybe has some of the characteristics of meditating in that it takes you further past the logical mind into, uh, let's, how, how should we say it? Um, the, well, we used to say the right brain versus the left brain, but we now know that the right and left brain are more uh, connected than we first thought. But, uh, you know, I can say meditating takes you a little bit further away from the logical uh, function of the brain and more to the creative and imaginary, imaginary function of the brain. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame this sort of thing isn't taught in education as well. Well, they might do now, but when mm -hmm. I was at uni, they definitely didn't, unless you sort of specialized in, you know, a master's in design thinking or something. Um, are there any sort of like snackable tips uh, and tricks students or those already working in the industry can, can use? Well, I'll give you a long and short answer to the question. When I was uh, a lecturer at what's now University of Lincoln, School of Architecture, I used to teach courses which were essentially uh, design psychology. Since moving back to America, I have taught uh, designers, um, I've given workshops and lectures about design psychology here, there and everywhere. So that was a way people could learn somewhat. Uh, but no university program has picked up design psychology uh, since I left England, and I think they should. But that's not going to happen overnight. So in the meantime, the short answer is any designer should read my book. And yeah, I also give webinars uh, about four times a year, uh, a series, a three-part series, where I take people back through these nine exercises be it designers or just people who are wanting to design their space based on their inner experience. So uh, people learn how to do it. I also, since I what became very frustrated about other university courses not being offered, I actually offer a year-long certification program in design psychology that I deliver via distance learning. So Awesome. How can people find out, <clears throat> excuse me, how can people find out about all this? Do you have a website or anything? Yeah, it's uh, www.designpsychology.net. Cool. And then they can just see my webinars. I'm about to advertise one in a few weeks that will start at the end of September. And they can also email me about the certification course. You have to take the webinar in order to apply for the certification. Cool. That sounds good. I'll check it out. This is um, <clears throat> slightly off topic, but 
I used to live with a friend who was really into lucid dreaming, so much so mm-hmm. that he um, he used to write books and sell them on Amazon and stuff. And whenever I bumped into him, he would sort of tell me how to, you know, lucid dream. And it, it was really interesting. But one of the things that he said he used to do, he used to be interested in all arts and that kind of stuff. And uh-huh. he used to basically fall into this uh, lucid dream and create artwork whilst in the dream and then he used to wake up and then recreate it and it kind of kind of strange but it kind of reminded me of um something else that i've seen online over the past few years of creatives using drugs and psychedelics to create artwork and Mm -hmm. there's a a, there's a well-known infographic and it's it shows the same artist creating the same um painting but on different drugs it's it's really interesting so you can see it from marijuana to ecstasy to heroin um not that i'm you know in favor of that sort of stuff but do you think these sort of techniques could ever be used commercially um well yeah you've got a there's a couple of uh, interesting things to say apropos of what you're saying about lucid dreaming so one i don't know the exact definition of lucid dreaming, but presumably, as with what I was just talking about with what we used to call the right side of the brain functions, the non-logical functions, by doing this lucid dreaming, you're bypassing the logic of, okay, I'm going to use this color here, and I'm going to draw a square there, or I'm going to design a, a three-foot room there. You're, you're just going for the for the pure uh, visual and perhaps emotional aspect of what you're doing. Mm. So in that way, it's similar to the guided visualization that I described in design psychology. It's also similar to actual dreams where you don't have to take marijuana. You don't have to meditate. All of us dream. So kind of number two, we all have Uh, accessible to us, amazing visual imagery that we're able to come up with. And that doesn't mean that we have to use uh, those actual visual images in um, some kind of way that Salvador Dali did, Um, but it shows us that we're all uh, innately visualizers. So we can rely on uh, that ability to help us envision uh, either what we draw or what we create in terms of uh, the built or designed environment. But thirdly, design psychology itself relies not just on that um, unconscious or um, non-logical ability to access visual imagery. Some of those nine exercises deal with really practical things like there's a exercise I do called uh, place sociogram where I have people draw a map and then uh, of their home a floor plan of their home and then color the private space one color the semi-private space another color and the shared space a third color and then when they sit back and look at this floor plan I say okay who owns the most space and uh, very often, if, you, if I'm dealing with young parents, for example, they say, oh, my God, <laughs> everybody owns space in this house but me. I don't have a private space. You know, we're not accessing some um, you know, deep psychological imagery or symbolic imagery there. We're looking at a, a very kind of logical analysis of, okay, what's the dynamic here? What's the social dynamic here? So yeah. in these exercises, I try to combine uh, both psychological, kind of sociological, and you could say some anthropological stuff as well. It's not one or the other. So that was a long answer. I don't know if that that addressed your question. Yeah, absolutely. I think knowing that it is possible to come up with these, you know, the same visuals without being under the influence is, is awesome. Um, I, I want to get on something as well. Um, Quickly, I I seen you've written about Maslow's hierarchy pyramid as well, which uh-huh. uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but I think I researched a little bit about it at uni, and I'm not sure if it falls under this the category of an exercise, but uh, could you run it 
run us through what it is and how it can be used? Okay, well, Maslow, as many of your listeners may know, was a humanistic psychologist who believed that we're all motivated to become what he called self-actualized human beings, whole fulfilled people. And he came up with this uh, triangle, which basically said that uh, our needs need to be met on a variety of levels. The most basic level was physiological need at the bottom of the triangle. Then safety needs have to be met. Then belonging and love needs then esteem needs, and only when all of these needs are met do we feel complete and whole. And what I've done in design psychology is transpose that uh, hierarchy of needs and come up with a model that talks about home or place as self-actualization. And similarly, at the bottom of this triangle, this design psychology triangle, I say you have to first, when you're thinking about home or place, meet the need for shelter, a basic need, and then climb the pyramid, the triangle. Then you have to think about home as satisfaction of psychological need, then as satisfaction of social need, and then as satisfaction of aesthetic need. And only when all of these needs are met do we feel that the place or home is completely fulfilling. But it's my experience, apropos of my previous comments, that designers are trained to look at home or places, shelter, you know, the roof can't leak, uh, it's got to stand up, and also home or place in terms of aesthetics, the beauty of the place, both of which are really important. But the social and psychological needs, the middle pieces are often like the poor stepchildren that are left behind. Mm. So again, Mm. each one of the exercises in my toolbox uh, is sure to deal with one level of this triangle so that by the time uh, people are done with the exercises, they can envision a place that makes them feel fulfilled and whole, at least in terms of a space. Yeah, love that. Again, just, you know, using something other than the sort of the traditional methods we use. Um, Right. Yeah, that's great. Another uh, thing that really interested me at uni um and i guess this kind of falls into the 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 realms of design psychology some in some way uh subliminal advertising so Mm -hmm. there's been loads of examples of this over the years but one that really stood out to me uh at the time and i still really remember it quite well is um is this burger king advert where they placed a one dollar bill into the lettuce of the burger on the advert um i think it was to basically communicate that you know the burger was only a dollar but i was always thinking is there any like you know shiftiness involved was the creative trying to be manipulative at the time or were they just seeing it as something you know fun and quirky i'd love to get your thoughts on this it's hidden a kind of hidden persuasion and i completely Uh, am against that. And design psychology is just the opposite of that, because that kind of hidden persuasion uh, manipulates the user, whereas design psychology involves the user in uh, creating their own space through their own participatory through, through a participatory process, rather than one where they're kind of victims of unknowing victims of that kind of hidden persuasion. They both use psychology, but to me, one is, you know, very much manipulation and one involves participation. Yeah, totally. You can see how sort of, you know, both use some sort of psychology um, to benefit kind of like both sides. But there's a, mm-hmm. there's another, um, there's another piece that I remember really well. And I'm not sure if you remember, but when Facebook first started out, it had this, on the landing page, it had this map of the world, and it had these location pins between different countries. And if you connected the location pins together, it spelt the word sex. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I'm not sure if that means anything or... Well, there's no doubt that sex and drugs and rock and roll sells, but at what what human price? (laughs) Yeah, there's always a price. But... um. 
Yeah, thank you so much for doing this with me, Toby. I really you appreciate too. it. Um, I've learned a crazy amount. Um, I'm feeling super inspired. And thank you so much for your time. I know we've tried to do this once or twice before and it hasn't really worked out because of technology issues and all sorts. But yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And yeah, let's keep in touch. Okay, well, it was great to chat with you and stay cool in England. Great. Thank you so much, Toby.